I V M. Hey everybody, welcome to another week on the IBM Podcast Network. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Paytm Money Upfront. We're still in lockdown and uh, we're trying our best to make our releases work, but we are occasionally getting a little late or slipping on some episodes. Hope that you guys continue to remain patient with us. Check out our uh, social media accounts. We're IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We're doing something over there called the IBM Smart Guide. A bunch of our hosts are talking about things to do during the lockdown, books, movies, podcasts, etc. Check it out. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And uh, let's get you onto your show right now. We are living in a time of tremendous disruption. Yet, it's also an interesting time because it's making us sit back and really reassess how we function both as businesses and as people. Or rather, how we function as businesses with our people. Because that's what businesses are, right? It's, it's the talent that work in them. It's the culture that drives them. It's about how interhuman relationships help build actual revenue and you know, in, in, in so many ways actually derive value. And it's time to kind of sit back and look at that. It's also a good time to kind of have conversations between us, between people who have run businesses, who have spoken about, about how work culture needs to be, to actually listen to people who've been saying all the right things for a while now. And one person who I've been you know, following for a while, as much for his journey as an entrepreneur, but also for his entire journey as someone who's really spoken about how work culture should function, how we should look at something like failures, how we should look at connecting to each and every person who works in our organizations and not just talk about it, right? He's actually made sure he's speaking to every person out there who follows him on LinkedIn and imparting what I like to call very interesting experiences, very interesting thoughts that help us all be better professionals. And that person is Ankur Variku, the co-founder of Nearby and someone who has a unique pulse on where work culture really is headed. I am Varun Dukerala. I'm the co-founder and corner chief of The Glitch. And we'll be right back with Advertising is Dead. In this moment, we are your podcast. The name is Football Should Ball. Hi. Presenting Football Should Ball. A show about three friends discussing our favorite game over a beer. Sometimes three, maybe even five. Hi, I'm Shiva and with me are my two sidekicks, Kaurav Sapre and Kartika Iyer. Sidekick? You mean like Batman's Robin or Van Percy Robin? No, I mean like Alexis Sanchez, but with a little more skill than just playing the piano. Ha, just shows how the best players at Arsenal are mere bench warmers at United. Oh, thank you, Iyer, but you're a Fulham supporter. So whenever you say anything to support me, I question my beliefs. Just like how Griezmann would say, Banter aside, we will talk match reports, transfer rumors, top controversies, fantasy football picks and so much more. So grab a beer and tune in to Football Should Ball every Wednesday on the IVM Podcast app, website or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Advertising is Dead uh, with Ankur. Ankur, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Roger. Thanks for having me. In normal circumstances, I would have loved to have I've done this in person in a studio, but such is the times we live in right now that we we have to do this on a on a Zoom call. Um, how has uh, lockdown been for you? It's been good. Yeah, it, it, it starts with the the same emotion that you just expressed. Uh, it's both fascinating as well as, of course, initially a little intimidating. That uh, you you almost feel like, oh shit, this. There's a world that continues to live without your physical presence mm. uh, that suddenly makes you feel small. Mm. Then you realize that you can actually get a lot of work done without being physically present. So that makes you feel stronger. And then you recognize all the options that open in front of you yeah. with the fact that you can just sit at home and, and manage and orchestrate your world. So uh, to be honest, the lockdown has been uh, good for me. It's a privileged spot that we all sit in where we have the comfort true, of a home true. and so many things that work for us. So I, I couldn't be, I couldn't be complaining and it's been really good. You, you've actually been working from home um, for, for a bit now. Yeah. Um, and I also thought it'd be interesting. I mean, while we'll, we have a lot of things that I want to speak to you about, but um, how does one work from home efficiently? I thought that would be an interesting thing to kind of start with. Uh, you 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 had a bit of a I would say uh, uh, heads up <laughs> heads up heads up on that but yeah. that'll be yeah. 
Oh, Omar Abdullah and I have 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 a deep experience yes. in film. <laughs> That's true. So, That's true. So, uh, so I, I actually took a an online session on this uh, last week, and I spoke very passionately about it. I think the biggest thing, Varun, that is necessary and critical for anyone to get work done from home is to have a schedule. And a schedule, not just for your work, but a schedule for your entire day. Yeah. Because when you don't have physical boundaries between your personal life and your work life, and you don't have physical boundaries between you're literally walking two steps and you could be in your kid's zone and you walk two steps and you could be in your bathroom and you walk two steps and you could be on your work table and you walk two steps and you could be in your kitchen. Yeah. Um, it is very important that you do not create not just physical, but also mental boundaries on where you allocate time and for what duration and for what purpose. Um, yeah, so that's that's the one thing, and and the more important thing I think, if, if you do have the opportunity to do so, is not just you having a schedule, but to also make sure that your schedule does not conflict with anyone else's in the house. Which means they also need to have a schedule. Because the worst mm-hmm. thing is you're on a schedule and everyone else is not. So they're like Papa, Mummy, Beta, and all <laughs> these things happening while you're trying to be in that zone. Not going to yeah. work. Yeah. I think this is actually more structured than you would ever normally have your life because you would try to rush through things and and head off to work. And yeah. I've actually realized that, like like you said, it's so rightly so the fact that now there are so many more things to take care of that if you don't have a structure, that is like the, um, the I mean that can only go south. Um, oh yeah, totally. But I, what I'm actually been noticing also is a lot of younger people who are, have, you know, just because work culture o- over the last many years has been built around that. Right? It's been built around the fact that people kind of come together and, you know, it's that whole campus atmosphere in, in startups and in and, and young companies with younger people in. Um, so everyone's so used to kind of being in that. And now suddenly everyone's in their own spaces. Um, it There is a, a you know, it also then speaks a lot about where does work kind of go from here? Like where does, where does how we, how we do things go from here? Like, you know, how do we do it now? But also really where, where will it go tomorrow? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I actually feel that there is going to be a tectonic shift in how people work and live their lives. Um, I, I'm an irrational optimist, but despite that, I feel that whatever we're going through is going to be there for at least a year, if not more. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I don't mean necessarily the lockdown, but controlled movement, social distancing, uh, remote working and so on. And, uh, and that is all the time that it will take for people to get habituated to it and for companies and organizations to adapt to it and reorient themselves and their processes. So I believe there's going to be a massive upsurge in how people balance between remote working and their social needs. So there will be, in my opinion, pockets and times when the company will almost force everyone not to work individually from home, but to get onto a Zoom webinar with your team. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's almost like the antithesis of what used to happen so far, where companies were like, shut the fuck up, don't go to coffee breaks and sutta breaks so much. Don't yeah. go all of this and don't waste your time on social media and so on. Now companies will be doing exactly the opposite, which is, hey, you've had an hour of working by yourself. Come on to this group chat now. Come on to this group thing now. Uh, yeah. Get that, that social juices and emotions flowing. Um, and that will be the same thing that then recreational spots or discretionary experiences will start serving. It's not so much about you going out to eat because you feel lazy or you want to taste something which you haven't tasted for a while, it's to actually fulfill your desire to connect with people and to have a, an in-person social experience that you've been missing for the last 16 hours. You know, it's interesting uh, that so uh, sometime back, uh, before all this happened, I think about six odd months ago, I'd actually read this whole piece about um, how uh, offices were trying to build out structured chill areas. Um, so mm. the word structured chill for me just kind of was interesting <laughs> because that um, it sounded it sounded like such hardcore marketing speak, but um, it generally uh, so. And then we had actually even discussed this in office that right? we, we had discussed okay, let's create an area here where people can actually do work, but yet it has a chill vibe. It cannot be hundred percent chill. 
uh, what you're saying is pretty much that, but now it's actually virtual. It's not a physical space. Yeah. And and I think it's also made things a little more casual. I know there are some professions where we can't be casual, but I think people are now okay with, I mean, to not have to be, you know, there is there's something called meeting attire and then there is something which is <laughs> general home t-shirt and shorts. But I feel yeah. that we're, um, but they're also calling it uh, uh, waste up fashion now because I think, think that people <laughs> waste on because they're not seen. But I think it's also made things a lot more relaxed. I think it's made it more personal. So yeah. I'm kind of optimistic about that part that might actually help bring teams together a lot more than than separate them. No, totally. I, I actually feel that uh, this will bring out a very different side of productivity and and human perseverance in a way that the world has never seen before. Because honestly, the last 100, 120 odd years have been all about the industrial revolution and factories and clinical designs and just do this, don't think about this. There is work, there is home, and then there is work like balance and so on. But now it's almost like we've been pushed, not by choice, but by luck into a world that was before the 1900s where, where, where there was fluidity, where people had multiple professions, where people had multiple social roles during the day and there was no segregation, but it was just fluid. And um, I think we will do very well to just get back to that time. Of course, there's a lot of anxiety to be managed in the middle until mm-hmm. that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the eventual state, I, I feel, would be uh, very interesting. Um, no, what, what you're kind of saying right now is also interesting because um, how you also been o- over, over the recent past uh, increasingly become a content creator, right? I mean, that has been yeah. one of those pieces that you kind of grown. And a lot of the stuff that you've spoken about uh, in an interesting way is more relevant than ever now because um, it, it speaks about, you, you've spoken about mindset, you've spoken about failure, you've spoken about the kind of struggles that you kind of go through in your own mind sometimes and not necessarily um, just uh, stuff that is uh, technical. Uh, about how you kind of work uh, on in different aspects. Um, have you looked back at the kind of stuff you created? And I want to get into how you started creating and why. But have you looked back at a bunch of the stuff that you created and said, okay, one second, a lot of that stuff actually seems to be a lot um, more pertinent to today's time than it ever was? I, I, I do, not actively though, because I'll, I'll have to admit, Varun, uh, uh, a large part of the content that I create, if not all, uh, comes from just living it myself so mm. i don't i don't have a script i don't have a structure when i start recording or when i start creating content because it just comes from the heart it comes from my own experiences i've thankfully practiced over several years to get the articulation in order but the the story the context is is very personal it comes from that vantage point so uh, i i don't necessarily need to reflect on it because i i almost always am giving it mm. and, and and it's just a constant reminder that at the, at the end of it, everything boils down to the mindset. It's not so much about what you know, but how you process that information, the stories that you tell yourself. And, and at the end of it, uh, what is your self-image that, uh, that you have for your own self? Um, so, so I do reflect on it, but, but not as, as content pieces or, or not as something that may or may not be applicable. I, I just reflect on it because it's largely my own life. Okay. How how did that how did you start off making content? Where, where did that kind of like get kicked off? So that was an interesting story, and this happened. So I've been blogging for for now fifteen years. I uh, I started blogging in two thousand five, and I've been actively blogging ever since. Uh, but I realized uh, people have stopped reading, and uh, and then that's just how how the world's changed. Uh, there's yeah. a lot more visual uh, consumption that happens. And uh, and that's fine. So uh, so I remember in 2016 uh, we had just raised our first round of of our funding for for nearby, which is a startup I was running. Mm-hmm. And um, and as usually happens with these fundraisers, is that there's a lot of press that comes your way, mm-hmm. and and you get written about. Mm-hmm. And what I was surprising is uh, not all of it was positive. So there were enough people who were who were writing things that uh, had no basis, but just because they had access to a distribution, they were able to write it and get away with it. Yeah. And, and to be honest, I, that made me really mad because I was like, this is, this is not fair and it's not an equal ground. Um, like I'm the one who's a recipient because it's been spoken about me, but I have no resolve 
to to even refute what is being said about you. So it came from that point that uh, in 2016, as an organization, we said we want to own our story, mm. and we want to create a distribution platform where we have direct access to our consumers or to people that we care about. And whatever is it that we want to say, we will say it directly to them without the need for any media, any PR, anything. Like that. that was number one. And number two was through this, we also wanted to create an image and a brand for potential talent, people who could work with us, because we felt that that was the biggest need that we wanted um, to be served. While everything else could be maybe bought, but talent can very rarely. You have to create for the best people the right culture and and or speak about it in the right manner. So, two thousand sixteen, um, LinkedIn launched their video feature. Yeah, and I was blogging on my website and had moved to LinkedIn. I'd seen some success, but I was like at some five thousand, six thousand followers or so. Um, and then they launched this feature, and I waited and I waited and I waited, but it didn't come my way. It wasn't turned down. I don't know what the uh, the rollout plan was. So mm-hmm. one fine day, I just wrote a post, tagged Jeff Weiner, who's the CEO of LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, saying, hey, Jeff, what do I have to do to get this video feature enabled for my profile? Uh, and in the next hour, someone from the product team at LinkedIn replied saying, uh, we're going to activate it. For you. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's, it. That's, all, that's all it took. Seriously. <laughs> so it reminded me of the biggest life lesson that I've stayed with, which is if you don't ask, the answer is always no. So true. And I made a video on that. Using the LinkedIn video feature, which is this is what it is. It just happened to be on a Wednesday, and I called the series Variku Wednesday so that it just sounds nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was it. That was the start of Variku Wednesday, which is the biggest series that I've done. And every Wednesday for the last four years now, uh, we've been shipping out a piece of content in long form, and it started all on LinkedIn. And uh, now, of course, it's taken a life of its own, but the the genesis of it was the desire to own your own story and then reach out to an audience directly. Were there, um, and, and over time, you also the kind of increase. I, I've noticed that some things that you've changed, right? Some things, uh, for instance, I remember, in, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, initially there was a lot more English and now you do a lot more Hindi now as yeah. the audience has kind of widened. Yeah. Um, have you seen that that actually helps in kind of, because what I'm interested about is that LinkedIn content is not something that gets spoken about as much, but it's 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 actually a great platform for content creation and distribution. Um, very undervalued, in, in, at least in 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 my mind. Um, and and you've seen a fair amount of success with that. Uh, what what works? Yeah, I I couldn't agree more with you, Varun. I I feel LinkedIn is the the biggest arbitrage platform out there when it comes to content. The, the effort to reward ratio is massively skewed. Almost everywhere else, you have to put in a lot more effort. You get very little rewards. And it's exactly the opposite. Um, and, uh, and yes, I realized, and this was just an experiment, that I felt LinkedIn is all about English and it's all about people like you and I. Um, but then I just realized that the power of LinkedIn is a lot more than what I imagine it to be. And when I did the experiment in Hindi, I got far more response than I usually do. Mm-hmm. And that propelled me to consider Hindi as uh, a legit alternate channel for the same kind of content. Mm-hmm. Uh, so today I create content every week in Hindi and in English. It goes exclusively in Hindi on TikTok. It mm-hmm. goes as a mix of Hindi and English on, on LinkedIn. It goes mostly as Hindi on Facebook. And I think Instagram is the only channel where I'm still almost 100% English. Mm. Um, and Twitter, of course, is 100% English. Mm. Um, and, and there are two or three things that I've realized. One is uh, vernacular is exploding. Like this is just Hindi. And mm. I, I know of entrepreneurs and I work with them closely where they've done Tamil, Telugu, Marathi, Gujarati. And it's just exploding because Geo brought in a completely new wave of population that came onto the internet in a big way for the first time and in millions and they are just consuming content. They're not buying anything off the internet as yet, but mm-hmm. they're just consuming a lot of content. So so it works to create a community. It it needn't be monetizable, but it's definitely creating a community. Mm-hmm. Uh, two, I just realized that storytelling in Hindi is far more effective. Mm-hmm. Maybe because it, it's our first language. Maybe I feel that the language is richer in, in its vocab. 
So a lot more emotions and a lot more reactions come my way when uh, when I do write in Hindi. Mm-hmm. And um, and the third is uh, it's it's surprising how the Hindi content with English subtitles reaches or still continues to reach a global audience. Mm-hmm. So it's almost as if people don't even care what they're sharing mm-hmm. as long as they can read whatever it is. And all that they're seeing is just the body language and the and the facial emotions that come out. You know, you make an interesting point. Right? So, for instance, I'm I'm uh, from Andhra Pradesh. I'm Telugu, mm-hmm. and for the longest time, as I started this whole podcast journey about a year and a half ago, um, I, somewhere midway through, I realized that my content was just generally posting episode creatives, and I and, and I need to put more stuff out. And I started putting out, I mean, written posts as share stuff, which I thought thought was interesting. Um, have considered doing video many times, but I've always there's been a thought at the back of my head that I don't know how much Telugu content there is, right? I mean, I don't know if there are, if there's an entrepreneur in the creative space who's actually talking to um, kids out there uh, about what they can do. And the question has always been there. So you make an interesting point about using different platforms with different languages. So I think that's an interesting uh, distribution model. I think what many people try to do is have like multiple channels. Like I know people... Uh, YouTubers, for instance, who have like a Hindi channel or an English channel um, and they kind of spread it out that way. But I think what you're saying is a lot more interesting, especially from an entrepreneur to content creator mindset where you're not necessarily trying to replicate, but you, you, you're putting the right kind of content in the right space. True. True. Um, when you look back at your uh, at your journey, right, in terms of as an entrepreneur, um, you, you started off from a, from what was what can be called and I've might be a very wide bucket, but more, more of a corporate portfolio, but you kind of move towards being an entrepreneur. Uh, yeah. Love to hear a little more about that. How, how was that journey for you? Yeah, it's been fascinating. I mean, I'm, I'm actually in the middle of creating a, a, a webinar, which just goes through this journey and, and helps people recognize that what we classify or treat as risks are actually just stories that we tell ourselves. Mm-hmm. So, I've taken a lot of risks and I've made a lot of pivots in my in my life. I uh, I went to business school and that wasn't something that I was meant to do. I dropped out of my PhD, uh, which was towards becoming a space scientist. And wow, that, that that's a, that's an interesting one too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so I was in the US uh, in a PhD program on a hundred percent scholarship on a fast track to complete that PhD facing my exams, everything was going as per plan. But I just realized this was something I was good at, but not something that I was happy with. And and that was a big realization where for the first time, it struck me these two things could be different things. What you're good at and what you're happy with needn't be the same. Mm-hmm. And I came back to India, I dropped out of the PhD, um, did my MBA from ISB, and then took up a very clinical consulting job uh, loved my time, three years, taught me a lot, worked with really smart people, great clients, great projects. But somehow I think the, the key in me to become an entrepreneur was there. I didn't know when, but I knew that it would happen. And um, and it was a serendipitous uh, move. I, I was catching up with a friend of mine from business school one fine evening, and, and he spoke about a business that he had just started up. He asked me if I could help. And I was, in my naivety, I was like, yeah, I can, but I don't want to leave my full-time job in consulting because I'm really enjoying it. So why don't I become a part-time entrepreneur? Mm. Uh, and now I know there is nothing called a part-time entrepreneur. <laughs> Either you yeah, are yeah, one or you're not. No, it's impossible. <laughs> exactly. So, so for a year, I, I pretended to be a part-time entrepreneur and uh, and we launched the business. Uh, he was full-time into it. it. It worked really well. And then I quit my consulting job in 2009, 10 years back. And, uh, and I became a full-time entrepreneur. That was my first entrepreneurial stint. Um, and I've been an entrepreneur ever since. Uh, multiple multiple startups, multiple roles. But uh, the DNA remains the same. Um, and the entire nearby journey also has been an interesting one, right? It's about the fact that it, you were, were employee number one. Like, well, not employee, I would say uh, person number one, Groupon India. And then eventually yes. the, 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 the buy, buyout and... Uh, and becoming nearby yeah. and um, talk about that part a little bit. I think what is interesting is that I think ever since, especially the, during the nearby time, there were so many things that you've spoken about doing. Um, I mean, you've spoken about consumer culture on one end, you've also spoken about um, your the entire failure resume and, and yeah. so many other things. I 
think a lot of things kind of came I, I would say your content creator journey and what you're going to speak about now kind of started off with, with some of the thoughts that start off during your nearby journey absolutely uh, it, it taught me so much as an individual I learned so many things that I was not good at that I had to fix I grew as an individual and then most of it happened uh, in, in the last five to eight years so uh, so you're right I was uh, I was the one who started the group on India business in group on I uh, sorry the group on India business in India and did that for four years from 2011 till 15 and it was very obvious that group on had its focus on US and Europe which were the large markets for it mm-hmm. so their attention towards Asia Pacific and within that India was limited understandably so Yeah. And uh, I was a firm believer in the India opportunity to continue to be. I feel that it's a massive market. So it needed a very different temperament. It needed someone to pay attention, to handhold it, to actually be patient in this journey. So we went to Groupon Global HQ and uh, we proposed something rather audacious. We, we said we want to buy the business from you. And, uh, and that, was, that was actually a very crazy call because they're like, we're a public listed company and you're mm-hmm. a 100% subsidiary. Uh, this shit doesn't happen. Like, no, one, <laughs> yeah. no one buys 100% subsidies of public listed companies. Like, no, no, we, we, like, we just think it through. And it took about nine months of convincing why it made sense. But eventually they saw merit in what we were proposing. And, and we pulled that off. We, we bought the group on India business. And that became nearby in 2015. Uh, we changed the business model completely. We changed the brand name. We closed down a lot of verticals that I felt didn't make sense. And, and that's what the journey has uh, continued to be until, until now. You know, a couple of years ago, you started speaking about your, the, the failure resume, right? Yeah. Um, and and there, there was some inspiration to that, but it's a very interesting thing that you picked out because it was failure most times is something that we don't really value as much, uh, which we should, uh, because we are who we are because of the failures that we've had in, in our, in our lives and careers, right? And So let's talk about that a little bit. I think, I think the failure aspect, especially, I mean, I'm looking at today's time. I, I think it's more relevant than ever. Couldn't agree. I'm, more, I, I, I'm passionate about failure. I, I can speak on and on about it. And I feel that not enough is spoken about it. Not enough is shared. People kill themselves thinking that they are a failure when all that they are is just facing temporary loss. And, um, and it's, it's devastating to see how many people just fall simply because they, they, can't, they can't just fulfill the expectations of the world. And they, they've been living someone else's life and not theirs. So the failure resume just came about because I, uh, I saw it being written by this professor in the U.S. called uh, Johannes Hasoffer. Mm-hmm. Um, if I get the name pronounced right. And, uh, and what he said was that a resume is a very strange thing because when you write a resume, you're essentially just writing all the good things that have happened to you. Like literally every possible thing. Fifth class, I won the elocution contest. Eighth class, I won the racing. Then this promotion, the dad cricket match in my company. Every goddamn thing that you can think about that you've done in life, you list all of that. I have to confess that I, I once put in my resume <laughs> that I won, um, I won in a state level Telugu film song singing contest when I was in fourth standard. It was in my resume for whatever random reason at one point of time. That, so that, that, that's, still something, that's still something very commendable to write about. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I don't think it was state level because they called it state level. I think there were 10 people who participated and I came third. So I don't think I can claim <laughs> Too much uh, uh, glory in that at all. Uh, but we, we all have done it. We all have done this. And you know, he was like, how is it that we know the most successful people have failed a lot of times and they have dozens of failures and they speak about it proudly. But where is that? When does that get spoken about? So mm-hmm. he wrote his own failure as well. And I was just blown away by that. Like, this is the shit. Like, this is what people ought to do. Uh, and of course, it's easy to say it because who like it, it's, it's almost like if you don't want to do it then it just sounds like a great idea for someone else to do yeah so so i was like okay why don't i just do it like just list down everything that i failed at and i failed miserably at so many things um and i made that resume and i put it online on my on my blog uh, and it just went viral like people picked it up and 
the, the messages that I got, like just literally came in where people were like, oh my God, this is just so heartening and so comforting to know that someone like you has also failed. And like, what, what were you thinking? You know? how, mm-hmm. how is it even conceivable that one would think, oh, you yeah, banda be in yoga life. Correct. So, uh, so that was, that was the start of it. And that's when I did, dug deep into the entire concept of failure. I read a lot about it. I started speaking about it a lot. Um, and I, I'm someone who thankfully has reached a point in life where I couldn't care less about what the world thinks of me. And I think that's a, that's a beautiful spot to be in because when people ask me, what does happiness mean to you? Mm-hmm. I always say it just means the ability for me to do whatever I want to do without caring two hoots about what the world thinks. That is so and true. That is it. That's, that's the bottom line. I think what you say is, is correct. I think when, when, you know, early on you, you mentioned, um, so I, I think privilege is a word that's also used very widely, but I think to earn the privilege of, of being able to have, um, that is what you earn through all the years of, of having, um, run through a journey, um, of, of building something. Um, yeah. And what it, I think, also gives you is, is, and that's what I find uniquely interesting about your content is that what you speak about are things that it, it's not pertinent to. Okay, if you're in leadership, or if you're an entrepreneur, or if you're in X, Y, and Z uh, spaces, um, it'll only be relevant to you. These are wider things which we, we most times ignore, which which we need to keep in mind, uh, and which kind of get stuck in our mindset. And it's almost, I know, it's like it's not. I wouldn't call it musings, but I would call it. Something that, you know, if you, if you stick into your mind a little bit, then it might actually help you no matter who, which level or whichever industry you work in. That's, that's the way that I'd like to think about this. Here. I, I, I'm a firm believer. Nothing of what I say is new, is unique. It's something that you haven't heard before. Um, it's just a stark, harsh reminder that this is how life operates. And it's hopefully delivered in a fashion that helps you retain some bits of it. So it's just a quick reference guide that, oh my God, everything that our parents told us was possibly right. But this guy has just said it in a minute that will stay with me almost like a flashcard or a kunji that, that we used to refer to when, when preparing for our exams. Yeah. Um, and that's the only hope I have. What actually even enjoys your tonality, right? I, I, I think a lot of uh, content uh, in this space tends to be very, you know, um, I hate the word hustler mindset, but I think that's the only way to put it. Um, I think it takes it into one zone of saying, okay, if you don't hustle hard, if you don't do these things, then you're not going to be anything, um, which is the antithesis of what you should actually be telling people. Um, I like the yeah. fact that the tonality in which you actually put things across is a lot more like, don't worry, worst case you'll fail. Uh, but, uh, and these are things you just keep in mind, which I think is honestly what, because because when I, whenever I'm speaking to younger people these days, I feel that the pressure for them to be able to, to just perform in their jobs, to be able to show that they can become successful. The fact that they, they, they all want to become entrepreneurs because the, the, the halo around it is, is so large. Um, and many of them aren't prepared um, mentally because of what they kind of see out there as to what all actually goes into being an entrepreneur. Um, and, and, so, and it involves failure. It involves it's also a very lonely place to be in. Totally. And, uh, and, and they kind of need to hear a lot of these pieces. Um, is this, so I know you invest as well. Is, is this a conversation you have with companies you invest in as well in terms of just, just these pieces of kind of um, giving them just these kind of thoughts? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So, one one big criteria for me to invest, Varun, is that I will also get the opportunity to be a coach or a mentor to the founder. Hmm. And and that starts with whether I think the founder is coachable or not. Um, and, and many people are not because they just believe that they have nothing left to learn and all they have to do is just execute. Um, but uh, I I feel that the biggest value that I bring beyond capital is the the ability to to go deep into the human psyche and not make it sound like if someone is successful, it is all because of hard work, and if someone is poor, it is all because of their laziness. Mm. Um, that is so not true. And yeah. there there are there are layers and layers of, of of privilege, of luck, of your own self image, of self doubt, of imposter syndrome, where all of that affects 
and then you're so right, like entrepreneur or entrepreneurship in general is just a lonely profession. And, and we make it even lonelier for ourselves because we think that we are the only Dada who doesn't get it. Everyone yeah. else is so sorted and everyone's raising capital and everyone's getting featured in 40 and the 40 and everyone's killing it. And to me, if Dada is not getting anything, and your company is getting laid off, and your company is growing, and we just... We just continue to embed ourselves into the expectations of what the world wants from us or what we think that the world wants from us. And this is a tough time to actually be in the workforce, to be entrepreneurs. It's it's actually one of the toughest times because, I mean, I I remember that we started Glitch Off a year after 2008. Um, So we kind of, so we kind of uh, profited from the, from uh, not raw profit, it was a bad word, but I would say that we we built off of the uh, of the state the world was in um, after recession. Um, but I think now especially is a very tricky time because not just what people people who are running startups are finding it tough to figure out how they're going to survive. Um, students don't know if they're going to get jobs after this, right? And and the the worst I've honestly felt off late was when someone who wants to come in and do their internship. Um, writes yeah. in and says that how can I still do it? And you're like, I don't know how we can, uh, yeah. because I mean, how do you intern remotely? You can't as much as you might think you can. Um, so it is a tricky time. Um, uh, what what would you think is the right way to deal with that? Yeah, I I actually feel that this is a reality that we will have to face. Uh, There will be jobs pulled out. There will be jobs cut. There will be pays that will be cut. And you you will have to first start with the acknowledgement that this is not what the world wanted to do. It is nothing personal. We have all landed in this together. And this is temporary. This is not going to make or break your life. Nothing of what we are going through right now is going to, at least for a professional, an entrepreneur, it could be different because it could actually have devastating results, but keeping that aside, mm-hmm. for a professional, whether it's a student or someone in the in a job force that has been laid off or has had to go through a pay cut, these are temporary times which are going to come back. The best gift that you can give yourself right now is to not take it personally, is not to blame yourself for where you are, is not to feel sorry for yourself, and to continue investing in your own growth. Because once this is over, and who's to say when it will be? But once it is, because it will definitely be over, mm. there will be suddenly again a mad rush for people. Yeah, And there will be factories that will need people. There will be agencies that will need people. There will be companies that will need people. And at that point of time, it will be very evident who continued to chill and watch Netflix and who continued to invest and be a learner in this period. Yeah. And and that is what you would want to prepare for. There's nothing that anyone can do at a personal capacity right now to be in a in a better spot. Uh, my heart goes out to people who are financially not secure because that could mean a very different thing for them. Yeah. And but that's a longer conversation. But as long as you are financially stable and whatever the government is doing to help, whether it's loan EMI waivers and so on, take that. Um, if you don't have a cash flow situation, uh, which is to be spoken about, use that, uh, but continue to invest in your personal growth. Don't think of this like, oh my God, I don't have a job and I can't do anything. So it is going to go away. The world is going to come back to normal. If there are a few things that you feel that uh, would be a good thing for someone to invest in for their personal growth at this point of time, what, what do you think those things are I mean, on, a, on a wider scale? I, uh, yeah, it's... Um, I don't. I don't want to. I know it's, in, I know it's industry hard. dependent, but yeah. still. Yeah, I I feel that there there needs to be an appreciation for how the world will be post COVID, and a thought around that. Uh, as we were discussing before before we started recording the podcast, yeah. what what is the world going to going to shift to? I, I genuinely feel there will be a lot more emphasis on remote management, which makes me believe there will be a lot more emphasis on say HR technology. Mm-hmm. There'll be a lot more emphasis on uh, remote content creation. There'll be a lot more emphasis on managing people's emotions. There'll be a lot more emphasis on food production and organically and urban farming. There'll mm-hmm. be a lot more focus on healthcare. There'll be a lot more focus on preventive healthcare. 
there'll be a lot more focus on how you create uh, public spaces which are safe and healthy and sanitized. So if you take a bet or at least have a view on where the world is likely to be, yeah. depending on where you currently are, your industry, your function, your expertise, you yeah. have to mold yourself towards that direction. As again saying, oh, this is what I know, so I'm going to do it this way. Simple example, if you're an HR recruiter, you have been used to recruiting in a certain way, which is put up a job posting, uh, invite applications, shortlist them, then call people for an interview, go to that round, 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 and then finally make an offer. Mm -hmm. That is not going to be the way hiring happens in the post-COVID world. Mm -hmm. It is going to be largely managed remotely. There's going to be a lot more off-person testing, off-person evaluation. So people need to be trained on that. People need to have tools and systems for that. So yeah. if you're a recruiter who only knows how to conduct a personal interview face-to-face -face or only knows how to organize one, but doesn't know how to conduct the Zoom meeting, doesn't know how to do an online evaluation, does not know how to get applications in a, in a manner that online has never worked on an HRMS or a recruiting tool, you're going to fall behind. Simple as that. Because the world shifted and it shifted just in six months. Yeah. Um, you know, while there is a one more interesting piece, which I want to talk to you about, but I, I think I'll make it a part of the last part of, of what I do in every uh, episode. So the last part of every episode is called humans of advertising, right? It's me, um, not trying to be current Johar, as I've said multiple times, it is me <laughs> trying to just have a slightly, uh, I wouldn't say lighter, light, light is a bad word. So it's slightly, um, random uh, ending to, uh, to each of my episodes. Um, I first want to start off by asking you, why are you so uh, fascinated by Batman? Why is Batman your favorite superhero? <laughs> because he wasn't born a superhero like most others, he uh -huh. became one. So I, I, I love the underdog story where someone came from the literal lowest bottoms uh -huh. and worked on themselves to become someone who's bigger than who they are as an individual. And and Batman to me represents that guy, uh, and, and that's why I'm just uh, yeah I'm just fascinated by that story. You know, a while back, I'd actually given a, a, a talk at one conference where they, people had to come up with things they could say quickly, and I spoke about why we all need to be like Batman. And, and uh, I think my, my thought process was was, was similar. But I, my only addition to that was the fact that. Um, he has figured a way to be in between all these other people who have actual superpowers and he still doesn't have any Correct. He still manages to hold his own somehow. <laughs> and I think that is like the best thing to have. Like you, I said that this is how everybody in management will feel in any company always feels like everybody who works for you is genuinely more talented and knows more things than you do, but you are generally being Batman and helping manage things around, uh, was, was, was my point at that point of time. Because he does run the league, yeah. <laughs> totally agree. I, I think we we bond over this for sure. What are the other things that um, you enjoy um, just generally consuming um, uh, as an individual? I uh, I love photography. Um, mm -hmm. I it's it's something that I've done for for almost two decades now, and I've moved more and more towards my phone camera, and I love playing with that. Mm -hmm. um, I am a I'm a non-disclosed singer. Mm -hmm. I love singing, uh, but I've never sang in public. Um, mm -hmm. And it will take a lot for me to get to that point. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I love music in general. love listening to it. love humming along with it. And, uh, and beyond that, I, I, I genuinely like, I, I think I'm a very curious person by nature. So mm -hmm. I love just asking questions and digging deep into anything that may come my way and, and just get answers to that. Um, what can you put together in an instant? A content piece. Ah. <laughs> a sixty a sixty minute a sixty minute delivery on anything you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned before you start recording that you, you're not a huge podcast consumer. You, you, huge book reader. What what is your uh, content uh, yeah. consumption choice? Books. Books. Uh, any recent books that you read that you you would recommend people to read? I, I really liked. It. So if you if you as an entrepreneur or or even in general have read the hard thing about hard things by Ben yeah. Horowitz, one of he's books. A, yeah. yeah, one of the best books ever written. I love the authenticity of that book. 
he's come up with another book uh, which is uh, you are what you do mm. i think that's the title yeah. uh, and it's about culture it's about how you build culture and how you build a, a culture which is stays together and then fights against all all odds um it was a good book it was a really really good book because it it used something which uh, i didn't expect from ben horowitz it, it uses history to illustrate the point so mm. not his life life story he he literally goes back into uh jengis khan and uh, black slavery and uh, and, oh, and other things to 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 create parallels between how they created very strong cultures uh, when it was almost not expected from them and and how you could do the same thing in your organization as well and lastly uh, why will advertising not die oh advertising is never going to die because humans would love a good story any single day of their lives and that is what advertising is all about it's about creating an emotive connect between what the consumer desires or doesn't even know that they desire mm. to what the human emotions at the base level are so i think advertising for me is storytelling and storytelling is never going to die ever uh, and that's why advertising is never going to die and before we end this uh, you have some interesting uh, pieces happening in terms of your content uh, when when can we expect to see uh, you work on a content series right and when can we expect to see that come out so that's just come out uh, two days back it's oh, called bari q w a r i q it's uh, it's a series where i ask uh, frequently asked questions about life So, uh-huh. so I figured a lot of people keep asking the same question. Hey, how do I find a mentor? How do I take tough choices in life? Mm. Uh, how do I switch careers? How do I do this? How do I do that? So, it's mm. picking up these frequently asked questions and then a long format series on that. So, it it launches it launches this Saturday and uh, it will be live every Saturday on YouTube. I think my question is going to be my, my question to myself should be why, why is my research not thorough enough to know that it launched two days ago? <laughs> 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 uh, Thank you so much for doing this, Ankur. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's it's been great, and uh, hope we catch up some at some point uh, once this is uh, once we're back, hopefully to whatever point of normalcy that we get to, and uh, and stay safe. Thank you so much, Varun. It was a pleasure. You safe, stay safe as well, and I, I'd love to catch up in person once all of this is over and we're back to normal. Bye. Bye. Are you constantly seeking happiness? Wondering how to make the most of every day? How not to let your inhibitions stop you from achieving your goals? It's now time to get your A game on. It's time to unlock your true potential. Tune in to the empowering series with me Zarina Poonawala to feel empowered in all genres of life. From behavioral skills to management skills, from health to relationships, from mental well-being to emotional well-being and of course your finances i've got you covered with these tips and tricks from me zarina and true life stories from my amazing guests you're bound to bring your purest to the table tune in to the empowering series with zarina punawala every thursday on the ivm podcast app website or wherever you listen to podcasts How many times have you motivated yourself to improve your sleep or lose weight or be more productive? How many times have you failed? Hi, my name is Ashton Doctor. Tune into my show The Habit Coach Podcast where we focus on creating small tiny habits to improve your life instead of those big impossible tasks. So make listening to me a habit every Monday, Wednesday and Friday on the IVM Podcast app or ivmpodcast.com. or on your favorite podcasting app